I'm Emmanuel Almonte, and the title of my project was the development of computer vision capabilities for assisted robotic applications. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to well, review my original plan, which some, most of you saw uh, earlier this year in March. I'm going to go over what changed, uh, what I actually ended up doing throughout my grant period. Uh, my involvement was the RoboCop conference, which took place in July into August. And last but not least, my cultural experiences, because a key aspect of the Fulbright grant is to have cultural exchange. Uh, so my original plan. Uh, the goal of my Fulbright project was to learn, experience, and contribute to the field of assisted robotics. And to this end, uh, I had the key focus uh, listed here. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the bullet point. Uh, so my focus were going to be computer vision applications. So that is uh, applications with the regard of how com uh, robots see the world. Um, so how they interpret camera images and process them uh, in the context of assistive robotics, right? And furthermore, I wanted to focus on engaging the end user. So that means the people that would benefit from assistive robotics. So people with disabilities, people, uh, elderly, pe elderly people, um, and really anyone else who could benefit from it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, through what's called human-robot interaction studies. So that's the field of how humans and robots can coexist. Uh, and then I also wanted to focus on, well, I wanted to gain the insight from the RoboCup, because I knew that the lab and was already very involved with this uh, international effort. So I wanted to learn from that and gain a lot of uh, insight into what's going on around the world and all the research that's being done. And finally, I wanted to look into commercial opportunities for assisted robotics here in Chile and perhaps throughout the world by looking into the Startup Chile initiative and so on. Uh, my project took place at the Laboratorio de Robotica at the Universidad de Chile here in Santiago. Uh, and it was under the advice of Dr. Javier Ruiz del Solar, who uh, runs the Advanced Mining Technology Center and is also a professor for uh, electrical engineering there. Oh. <laughs> Wait just a second. Um, okay, so real quick, I just want to review assistive robotics. So assistive robotics is the field of robotics that focuses on technology that can be used to benefit people with disabilities or the elderly. And more broadly, I just like to think about it as any robotic technology that can be used to help people somehow. Um, and my specific focus, or what I'm more interested in, is the humanoid robots. So humanoid robots are robots that are designed to be of a similar shape as a human, right? So they might have legs, they might have arms, they don't necessarily need to have everything, but the idea behind it is that they would interact with the world in a similar fashion that we do as humans. And I believe that this is important and more interesting because if they interact with the world similarly to us, um, then they can better help us with any um, challenges that we might face in our everyday lives. Uh, and why do I think assisted robotics is important? Well, um, in the ideal world, you would have uh, an actual person who can dedicate their time to helping someone with disabilities or the elderly in overcoming any challenges they have. But unfortunately, that's not very practical. Uh, we maybe just don't have the resources or just aren't able to uh, plan it in a, in a good enough way to make it work, right? So the next best thing would be to have an actual robot to help you overcome these obstacles and therefore give freedom and independence to people with disabilities. Um, so how did everything change once I got here to Chile? Uh, so my focus shifted from exclusively, say, computer vision applications to just more general applications that I thought were very relevant and needed in a specific way. Um, and I realized early on that doing these HRI, stu HRI studies that I wanted to do was going to be difficult, especially at the start because the team was preparing for the robot cup. So the robot was just very busy and you couldn't just take it out and go do a study. Um, but then after that, it just was very challenging to do studies like that, to bring things outside of the lab. Um, so it just really didn't, um, it wasn't possible. So I had to come up with more creative ways to get this information that I wanted. So instead of doing my own studies and getting the, my own input from potential users, I looked at other studies that people had done in other, uh, other universities and how they worked with uh, potential users and what they learned from them. 
So I inform my own research from those previous studies. Um, and I also realized that the commercial interests and startup Chile was really outside of the scope of my resources here in Chile. It was outside the focus of my professor, uh, outside the focus of my lab and everything. So it just wasn't necessarily practical to follow that line of research anymore. And I focused more on technical aspects after that. Um, and I, at first I had planned to like have one general overall project, but it ended up being better and smarter to have different sub-projects that I was able to learn more from. Um, and finally, I ended up having a much greater uh, contribution with the RoboCup and ended up learning a lot more and being more involved with that than I expected. Uh, so what did I do throughout my grant period? Uh, so I'm going to talk about two main sub-projects, um, and the first being a robust follow feature for the Bender robot, which was the robot that was created here at the Universidad de Chile, the only robot made in Chile, so it's pretty cool. Um, and the goal of this project was to allow the robot Bender to follow a user in a natural fashion. So this sounds very simple, but and it is. <laughs> this is really the ability for the robot to follow you around and not crash or kill people. <laughs> it's doing that. So it's very important for it to um, meet its goals, right? And the focus of this project was to have robust navigation and obstacle avoidance, uh, have a natural movement because you don't want to have to force the person to walk very slowly or have to do like really ridiculous things so that it would work. They just want to live their lives, right? Um, and to have safety as like the paramount thing, right? Because we don't want to have any issues. Um, so the follow feature. Well, when I first got into the lab, uh, they didn't have a follow feature working. And there was a, an undergrad student who was, who, who was doing a thesis on this project. So he, st he was already looking into uh, how it could be implemented. So how I started working with the lab is that I ended up joining uh, the student, Eduardo, on his thesis project, and we went from there. Um, so what we ended up implemented, implementing was the so-called OpenP track system, which is an open source software that allows you to generally track people in, well, any indoor environment. So that system is critical for us to be able to keep track of the user and not get confused, like say you're walking and then someone gets in, in between you and the robot. So how does the robot not confuse that person for you, right? So OpenP track was a very powerful tracking system that allowed us to track someone in a robust way. Um, then we also implemented a safety layer. So basically you have like these sensors, LIDARs, um, around the base of the robot. And, oh, by the way, this is Bender, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> so um, we implemented like a layer, so it's like perimeter, in which it's not allowed to move into. So when it's basically stationary, that perimeter is very tight, so it can really go through doors and stuff like that. But when it's moving a little bit faster, it becomes dynamically bigger, so that we take into account like stopping distance and stuff like that. Um, and finally, we implemented a lot of recovery behavior, because again, it was paramount to have this uh, natural movement for the user. So, you know, the robot shouldn't necessarily force the user to come back every once in a while, or recalibrate, blah, blah, blah. So if the person just walked too fast, got out of the field of view or something like that, the robot would be able to find a way to get back on track and not lose them. Uh, so I actually have this video, which is of a previous system that they had tried to implement, but it didn't work because um, I don't have a video of the actual system we implemented. But if we could play it, I think you just click it. Oh, is it open up in YouTube? Is it uh, probably, yeah, actually. I mean, so the purpose of this video is really to show you like the general idea of this project. Is it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So this older system was a bit slow, was a bit calibration project. Our system was meant to be fast and just like the person says follow me and the vendor can go. And you can tell that he's walking very slow. Again, our system was meant to have natural walking. So people walk like five kilometers per hour, I believe, on an average. So our robot, our system could work with that. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's basically it, avoiding obstacles, avoiding being distracted by other people, and stuff like that. Uh, we can move on from the video now. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's super simple, but it's, it's kind of remarkable that's not really something that's been solved. And even though our project worked and was proven, it might not necessarily be up to par to have it in a commercial environment or just like out in the wild, as computer scientists like to say. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. It, it was something that was demonstrated. Uh, so then my second sub-project, so my second sub-project took place during the second semester of the academic year here, um, and this is a cited guide application for the Pepperova. So the goal of this application was, again, an open source application for the Pepper robot, which is another robot, uh, to function as a cited guide. So real quick, if you don't know what a cited guide is, is um, the way by which um, people who can see well can help people that have visual disabilities uh, move through an unknown environment. So it's, um, it's a very natural thing that you might have done at some point if you ever interacted with visually uh, disabled people or visually limited people. Um, and you just basically grab onto their side or the, the person grabs onto your side and you walk with them and you can talk about the environment as you go. Um, so the focus of this project or the key focus on these projects were uh, to have a similar behavior to what a human sighted guy would do so that it would be very natural to the user. So it wouldn't have to be like a learning curve. Um, and to really focus on the needs and preferences of the target users. So instead of just building some system out of nowhere uh, that we thought would work well, like really, I read a couple papers on what um, people was, who are blind or have um, visual limitations think about these systems. And it was a really good research paper that actually explore how a group of, I believe it was like 15 people, um, would want a robot to assist them in a scenario like this. So it's it like, although I didn't have my own HRI study, I had an actual study on the particular thing I wanted to do to work from. And that study was great because it gave me a lot of um, like basically what the main needs and preferences were for the target population. And again, the motivation here, it, oh, well, not again, but so robots like Pepper, which if you haven't seen it, is this robot right here. It's available through a French company. Well, really a Japanese company because they bought off the French one. Um, and they're actually commonly available in Japan already in commercial centers and places like that. So the idea is that instead of building a robot that's designed to do this work, you just um, have an application for robots that are similar to Pepper or Pepper itself. And any robot working at a building, commercial center, wherever, hospital, can do this function all of a sudden. So how did this application work? Uh, we used the, I used the tactile sensors on the Pepper robot. So in this case, it has uh, three sets. So there's the set in the head, and then the two sets in the hands. Um, and one cool thing about this robot, or this specific application, is that it would work really well for children. So mostly, there's been other projects that have looked into how we can help people with, who are blind navigate through unknown environments, but they have always focused on adults, right? Uh, but given Pepper's height of um, 1.2 meters, about four feet, its hands end up being like two meters off the ground, which is about perfect for a child. Um, but its head, being four meters up, is still good enough for an adult to grab onto um, and be able to follow around with the robot. So with this application, uh, you have to, or I implemented speed control. So every different people are going to walk at different speeds. So how this application works is that the user can be like, oh, please slow down, please speed up. Uh, just bit, uh, by voice commands, or if they're grabbing onto the hands, they can do the very natural thing that they would do when they're using a sighted guide, and just kind of like tug or push to kind of like suggest that we're walking a little slow, we're walking a little fast. Um, and the robot would naturally react to that. And again, we have recovery behaviors implemented here. So making sure that the user doesn't have to go out of their way to make this work. The robot itself is keeping track of is the user holding on? Um, is there any issues that, to overcome? So, any obstacles? And another aspect of that is, actually I should have written a bullet point for that, 
but a sighted guide in like say an office environment would I don't know talk to the the user about the office and where things are and so this application also has like a conversation feature so the robot can be describing how it goes and everything like that and to do that navigation I use the ROS navigation stack which is a very popular um, system for navigation and is uh, open source so it's supported by the public and finally I had a couple other involvements as to say it that way uh, I took a machine learning course from my advisor uh, the first semester which I learned a lot um, and it was great because that's really where things are going in the field of robotics and computer science so it was critical to learn that and I ended up using what I learned there to uh, do a natural conversation feature which I implemented in the second sub project for the cited guide. And there was other research at the lab that I also worked with. So for example, the vendor robot is being, is being redesigned. So there's like a new body being made, new arms. And I just interacted with the lab and how they're doing that and learned a lot through that. Um, so real quick, here's the comfort. You can click it, the video. Hello. How are you? So you can have like actual conversations, Who I mean, actual conversations, but it uses machine learning to learn over time and it gets better and better. So you can have more interesting Where are you from? I'm from where all software programs are from, a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> and yeah, I implemented some things. But what is your location? I'm at the robotics lab at the University of Chile. What is your favorite fruit? My favorite fruit is the maki berry from the maki tree, scientifically known as the Aristotelian Chilensis. <laughs> so, I mean, you can like, just play like a half second of this. Hola. Is that sort of Spanish? ¿Cómo estás? I mean, it's critical to have it both in English and Spanish, since we are in a Spanish-speaking country, of course. But the cool thing about this system is that it's actually language independent. So any language that you can uh, somehow un understand through some software, then you can run through the system, and the system would, over time, using machine learning, learn better responses um, and be able to have a more dynamic conversation and more interesting. So yeah, that's that. Uh, real quick, I'm going to just talk about the RoboCup. The RoboCup is... Um, it's basically, uh, specifically the at-home league is the largest international annual competition for autonomous service robots. So really one of the most important events for service robotics in the world. Um, the Universidad de Chile has been very involved for many years, since at least 2006, but I believe before that. Uh, 2003, I want to say. Uh, so they have three teams. Uh, one team competes in the soccer league, uh, and then the other two teams compete in the at-home league, which is what I focus on, service robotics. And going to this competition in Japan uh, in July was a remarkable experience to just really interact with researchers from all over the world and just learn endless amounts of interesting things from what's going on throughout different places. Um, so I contributed through the Open Platform League and the Social Standard Platform League, uh, which so open platform is the vendor robot, so any robot. Social standard platform is the pepper robot, specific robot. Um, and here I took, uh, I took lead for the Help Me Carry Challenge, which was, which was one of the main challenges at the competition. Um, and yeah, so I also helped present a paper there. Uh, so the Help Me Carry Challenge is basically bringing in groceries into the home a very basic function for a service robot. Uh, and we did do well. The, the, <laughs> the challenge was successful, and my system for follow worked in this challenge. But unfortunately, due to unexpected situation, the robot broke midway through it. So after that, we were done, and there was nothing that could be done. Uh, so it ended there. Um, but there was, uh, we can skip that, it's just a, a little bit of the challenge. Um, there was the conference where I got to hear a lot of, from the research all over the world and learn a lot. I got to meet industry leaders and learn a lot again about what's going on. And I got to hear Dr. Schachmack uh, from the University of Washington 
who gave a really insightful talk that I really loved and actually inspired my second project, the Sighted Guide Project. Uh, so cultural exchange, real quick, just want to note that I've been volunteering at the robotics workshop on Saturdays, um, and it's been one of the funnest experiences I've done here in Chile. I got to go skiing for the first time. Uh, I got last in Japan with Chileans, which ended up being a very cool uh, cultural experience, because like, I didn't expect Japan to really add too much Chile experience, but it ended up really multiplying it, and it made us feel like a family after that. Um, there was the 18, which you know everyone I'm sure enjoyed it a lot here. <laughs> and I also volunteer with the English Corner at the university. Uh, so that's the robotics workshop. Those are the robots the kids work with. Um, that's a competition in Valparaíso. Those are the kids that won. I really cheered for them the whole time, and I, they were really cool. So I love that. <laughs> I love the happiness because they were not expecting it. Um, skiing, and then Japan. <laughs> meeting new people, uh, <laughs> dancing my first cueca, <laughs> eating insane amounts of asado <laughs> until you can't eat anymore, uh, rodeo, celebrating Bender's birthday because he was 10 years, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, robotics week at Valparaíso, uh, US Federico Santa Maria University, uh, just demonstrating Pepper to different uh, kids uh, in college and colegios. Uh, here in Chile, in Santiago, and from around the country, really. Ooh. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions, but... Yeah, we can, we can take like one or two, okay. yeah. First. When do you think these service robots will be like available for commercial and widespread use? Um, I think they can be available really soon, like um, now per se, in a limited, uh, in a limited way. So like, I don't know, you could have Pepper Robots helping people, but just under the understanding. Right now I'm working on a research problem. <laughs> under the understanding that it's not going to be very uh, robust. It's not going to be able to deal with a lot of situations that you would expect it to deal with. And I think of, over time it would just get better. Um, but yeah, basically now. Oh. Oh. And the first, the first one that you pulled up, the all you stuff. You needed that. Yeah, I heard about it. Um, right now. I actually didn't end up um, yeah. working with the Teleton because I was first hoping that the robot would be available, and then I would pursue those interact uh, studies with actual possible users. But then when things didn't really pan out, I kind of let that fall out. But yeah, it's, I mean, it would have been a great opportunity, but I did not get around to exploring it. <laughs>